Welcome to the Conduit Deeper Podcast, a podcast that takes a deep dive into the details that surround our current sermon series. From current events to fascinating finds to conversations that take us deeper into the Word. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Deeper Podcast. My name is Mo, Executive Pastor at Conduit Church, joined with our lead pastor, Darren Tyler. And today we have two guests, two new friends, two of our Israeli friends are joining us today. Dean Tesler is joining us, as well as Tammy Braslavosky. I'm sure I didn't say those. She'll correct you in a moment. Exactly the way they should, but they'll, we'll get to introduce uh, each of those here shortly. But um, Dean is, is here to tell a story to tell the story of his friend, uh, Bar Cooperstein. Uh, they were working security at the festival last October, October 7th, when the attacks happened. And he's going to tell the story of his friend and share some light on exactly what happened that day, along with Tammy, of course, telling the story of her son, her son, Ram, who was also at the festival that day. And so we're just grateful to have each of you with us this morning here in Nashville, Tennessee on a fall, soggy fall day. Uh, Welcome to seasons here in uh, middle middle Tennessee, but we're so glad that you are with us to tell these stories. Yeah, and I'm sorry that it's under these circumstances that we have to meet, but I do wanna, I just wanna say their names out loud because your, your son and your friend are still hostages. Uh, At the day of this recording, it is I think one year, three weeks and six days that they have been in captivity. I might have that off by a day or two, but they're still there. And, but we're still believing that they're going to be rescued. They're going to be okay. We know they're they yeah. going to be okay. Yes. They will come back yeah. alive. We that's, trust God. That's the faith of a mom right there. Tammy, let's start with you. So the Nova Festival, this was a Friday night. Um, where do, maybe we shouldn't say where, I don't know how security is. How far away do you live from where the festival was located? Like uh, two hours. Two hours. It's very far from our house. Um, yeah. So I do, don't know why, how we get there. So does Bar, he lives uh, he, with you? He was living at home? Yeah. Okay. So he went to the festival that night. Just like any other night, he was going out with his friends? No. Um, uh, what is it? A security guard He's going without to work. weapon. Yeah, he just uh, there is the opportunity for him to to get some money, yeah. you know, to work, and uh, he liked the music. So he goes on from Tuesday until Saturday. Like it was two event over there. It was uh-huh. the Juventi and the Nova. So he he's going to work, yeah. and I'm assuming he's staying at the festival yeah. and and then for you you're you know dean, dean you're working security yes this, so do you know bar ram, uh ram. Yeah, ram. ram so you know ram we didn't know each other before the that weekend actually that weekend i worked with her son uh-huh. ram, we became friends working together we working together and and yeah we all of us, we've been in security guards, but it's kind of to be a bouncer, you know? It's a, yeah. It's not really security guard. Yeah, when we think security, you know, in America, that's what we would think, a bouncer. Right. Which, that's what you thought you were being hired for. Yeah, if people fighting with themselves inside of the party, our job is to please leave, go home. Of course, yeah. not against terrorist attack and not like October 7. Yeah. And um, I can tell you the only weapon that we got, it's pepper spray. Yeah. You measure to yourself with hundreds of terrorists with pepper spray. Yeah. And so, and I don't want to get ahead of us on this. So look, tell me about that night, the, the party is going on. There's music going on. Uh, you guys are probably positioned around. And it was what time when the first attack happened, when you heard rockets coming, what time was it? 6.30. So it's all night party. Yeah. And it so, should to be till 5 p.m. If not... Uh-huh. Everything happened. It's a 20 hours rave. Wow. You call it American rave, right? Yeah. So it was from 9 p.m. Friday till 5 p.m. Saturday. Wow. So were you working all night long? With our son. Yes. Yeah. So from you, Thursday. We worked together at two festivals. Yeah. So at 6.30 a.m., 
what happens? We saw rockets in the sky and we got a call from the police, from the other security guards, tell the people leave. And this is what we're trying to do in the beginning. Me and my best friend, Bal Kuperstein, that's still hostage. Uh, we tell the people leave, take your stuff. And then I opened kind of emergency exit that it was the back exit from the parking lot to the main road. Yeah. And I tell people follow me, take them to the main road, tell them to go in left. This is what the police told me to tell them. And then I saw the first injured woman. She got from the car. She was bleeding from the head. And she had been shot. Yeah. So to, to me, that's an important point that people in America don't <clears throat> understand. That you living in, especially in southern Israel on the border of Gaza, you know, we, we call them rockets, but I, I almost don't like that word because it, it doesn't say what they really are, which are missiles. They're bombs yeah. that are being shot. But let's say we'll call them rockets knowing that they're bombs. That happens often in Israel, especially in the South. Um, I've been there and I've seen like how a playground for children, everything that you play on is also used as a bomb shelter. You know, it's, right. I still have a piece of shrapnel from a bomb from a, a park in, in a kibbutz um, that I keep as a, a reminder of the wickedness and the evil. But you saw missiles coming in, rockets, did it feel different immediately or did you think it was just another Hamas attack? For me, till I saw the lady, it was just another regular day in Israel with rockets in the sky. Yeah. I'm 22 years old, so I can tell about myself. Yeah. Growing up to, yeah, please do. to rockets, we're growing up to go and run into the shelter. This was our reality since we were kids. And for me, till I saw the lady, it was okay. It's another time with rockets in the sky. I will tell the people leave and soon I will go home. This is what we yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. People here in America don't know. We have things called tornado shelters that some people have, but we don't, we don't live under any sort of a threat of at any moment, someone could drop a bomb on our house, but you've had it because you grew up 23 years of it. It just felt normal to you, which is a, for us is a very strange thing, but for you, it's normal. Yeah. What felt, it was when you saw the woman who was shot, that was when you knew it wasn't normal. Yeah. What was not normal, besides the fact that she was shot, what was not normal about her being shot? For me, I just think it's rockets, but I saw the lady, she was bleeding from the head, and I started thinking and talking with her, what happened. In the beginning, she don't really respond, but I knew that probably something that more than just rockets. I mean, most of her car was under bullets and I understand that it's a terrorist, but again, how much you think terrorists, I think. Maybe yeah. few, five, six, 10, 20. Yeah. This is what I think. And no one imagined to yourself that 3,000 terrorists can get into Israel. And yes, yeah, so it just was injuries woman that yeah. take care of her with, bring her to the paramedic ambulance. And then a lot of injuries people came. Do you know if, uh, do you know if she survived? Honestly, no. And I wish to found her. I really, I don't know. I just put her in the ambulance and just keep taking care of injuries people. And I don't know really yeah. what happened to her. And, and I guess to make it clear again to an American audience, what's not normal was you've lived under the threat of rockets, but for decades it had not been where multiple hundreds, thousands of terrorists would come in with weapons and use guns and rocket propelled grenades. That was a new thing for that part of the region, at least in recent history. Yeah. And so you've bandaging her at what point do, so I've just, so you know, I've been to the site of the festival. Um, I've seen the memorial and it was, um, it was very sobering. Uh, because every picture, you know, they have, they've got photos like these, you know, that are on, on signs of, that represent, you know, the people that were killed or hostages. And so, I, but I'm only seeing them in pictures. You saw them in, in real time. Uh, how far away are you from where, like, the festival is now? And are people getting away or are the terrorists now coming at you and you have to run a different direction? 
So in the beginning, the terrorists wait on the roads, uh, close to Im, and also Beiri. The kibbutzim will get attacked. And every car that came, they just shoot on the car. The first injuries people came back after they did the U-turn and coming back to the party. And then a lot of injuries start to come to Regade. And that was on the main road? Yeah. I wish we, Micah, maybe we could put a map up and I could draw it out. Because I, I went along that main road and I saw all the cars that had been shot. It, it, it looked like a movie. It didn't even seem real. Um. And it was like, a, if you imagine in your mind, there was like, a, you're, you're at an outdoor festival and there's like a, a driveway to it. And the main road <laughs> out of that festival is where many of the terrorists seem to have been waiting and were shooting people as they were trying to flee with it. Um, did you make it to that main road or did you? The main road, yeah. You're on the main road now? <clears throat> 232 road. Were you in a car or were you on foot? I was on ATV. On ATV, <clears throat> okay. Yeah. And you have no weapon but pepper spray? Only pepper spray, yeah. Do you think it's a miracle that you're alive? I know that I'm a miracle in my life, honestly. Three, uh, 300 people died at the Nova Festival. 364, 364. and we have also hostages. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just the, the survival of that. Like, it's a miracle that you weren't. I mean, you were right in, running right into it and, and survived. Yep. And, and, and at that point, Tammy, you are, I'm assuming, asleep in your, or maybe just waking up. We wake up. Shabbat, you know? Yeah. There was the missiles, alarms, all the country, all Israel. And we wake up to the missile alarms, too. And we go to the Mamad, the shelter of the house, and we open the news. I didn't know that Tom go to this party. He just said to me, I'm going to a party, and it's been fun, it's music that I like. But when I saw that, uh, like, 9 o'clock, they started to say that it was a party in Oeim and people coming out injured, I just know that Tom's there. Yeah. And I started to call him and call him and call him. I was very stressed, and he didn't answer. It's like the phone is connect, unconnect. And finally, he called me at 10 o'clock with a notice phone, from notice phone. So, he, so he's calling you? Yeah. Okay. He doesn't have his phone until now. We don't know where his phone is. We can attract it. And when I hear his voice, he's just like say to me, Hi, mom, what's up? Like everything is okay. In 10 o'clock. It's like... Two and a half hours since the attack began. And I started to cry and he called me and he said, don't worry, mom, I'm okay. There is a uh, people in here, there is officers and cops, even injured people come here. There is paramedics, they give us water. And you know what? The officer that I'm calling from his phone, he just it, uh, go go back. They they send them a bus. They send the officer bus, and they vacuum them from the from the area. And he said to me after a while, he say, "Oh, you know what? What, mom? They just told me that they are going to send a bus for the soldiers, and I'm going to be on this bus. Something like an hour. They send the bus, and uh, I'm." going to be there and few hours I'm at home so don't worry about me I'm safe and I will try to call you again I don't have a battery in my cellular but if you don't hear from me know that I'm on my way home few hours I'm coming home but I need to give the phone back to this officer because he need to go don't call this number. I won't be with him. But know that I'm safe. I love you, Mom. Bye. And was he safe? No. We know that Tom was under heavy fire. The man that he talks from his phone is a scholar wife. He's a druzy. He's in his brother working the Nova, the... 
food food truck. Mm-hmm. He said he's a Drew. He Drew, yeah. yeah. And he met Tom. He and his brother ran away, like all these people, and they was hiding. And I said that, like ten o'clock in the morning, from nowhere under heavy fire, he saw the. Uh, it all, it's so warm. You yeah. saw him, like nice guy, like twenty, nineteen years old, come and lie down with him, and he say, "Warm told ask ask me, with a big smile, bro, can I call mom? Can I get a phone to call to mom?" And he said, "Sure, take it." And he say he amazed me because he started to calm her, mm. and we are under fire. Heavy fire, the terrorists all around us. We barely speak. We're terrified over there. We are, we are frozen. And this guy, this kid, calms his mom and tell her just like everything and made up a story that is a tense and they gave us water and everything was okay and I'm an officer. He's trying to make you feel better. Better. Yeah. He chose not to make me nervous. Yeah. Like others, you know, we heard people who called their mothers and fathers and everyone and scream, help me, we need help. There is no yeah. military, there is no officer, there is no IDF in here. We need help to slaughter us. And Rome chose not to do this. Wow, so in your heart, your mama's heart, when did you know? Did you know before that this wasn't what he said? No, I believed him. You believed him, yeah. I believed him. Yeah. And he called me. And I say to all my family, don't worry, Rome's there, but he's just a few hours and he will come home. Yeah. He's safe. He's with the officers. I imagine that is with the soldiers, with guns, and then IDF to control the area of Nova. And I was happy until I seen the news that was the sh- uh, fire uh, fire gun on this tents. It's called Hapak. Yeah. And people come to the hospital, survivor with blood, and say that they shouldn't over them. And I started to panic, started yeah. to call this person again, this officer that I saw. I still believe wrong <coughs> that the person he called from him is the officer. Call over and over again, he didn't answer. Hmm. Mo, when you were, so October 7th, I was out of town, as I remember, and because you were speaking that Sunday. But what, at what point during the day do you remember starting to hear about what was going on? Because I remember you and I started messaging about it. So obviously we're behind. It was hours later before we found out here in America. Do you remember? Yeah, I started seeing the reports on uh, X or Twitter. That's you know we started getting those initial reports that something was off, something was happening in Israel on that Saturday. And it's, it definitely seemed like whatever was happening was more than just a, um, like you said, it wasn't just a couple of random shooters. It started to paint the picture that there's were, these were thousands of terrorists um, coming down onto a festival. And I mean, it started to take shape pretty quickly and realize the severity of what was happening. Yeah. And, and, and in the middle of all that, that's kind of one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Dean is, you know, at what point did did you kind of get separated from Bar and realize, like, I, I don't know where he is or, or what's going on or I can't find him? Like, kind of how did that play out over the next few hours of that event? So after the injuries woman they saw in the morning, um, Bar and I were started to take care of injuries people that came to the road. And then more security guards would open another emergency exit that, the famous video that you can see people running in open field. Yeah. 
So the security guards tell the people where to run and take care of another few injuries women that get shot. We take them to the paramedic, to the ambulance, and then we go to the main road, 232 road. And when we saw the terrorists came from coming from Beiri, from the kibbutz in front of us, a bar just screamed at me and told me to go inside, to inside of the Nova. And we split up. I start running into the Nova. He stay. I just I heard also the the terrorists send RPG. They split up over there and then take Bar as a hostage. For me, I didn't see that. Uh, but from that moment at the road, it was the last time they see Bar till today. And I just started running into the party, calling my parents. Dad, don't worry, soon I'm coming back home. And Mom, don't worry. And after a few minutes of shooting, and you know, to, to, I understand that it's not safe to stay in the Nova. I start running into the woods, take with me a small group. We start running from bush to bush wow. to hide out, to hide out for one hour and half. And I've been there, so there aren't a lot there. How do I explain? The trees are there, but they're very yes. spread out. You can't it's, hide. Yeah, it's not. There was no place to really hide. Exactly. So, like, we have we like a bunch of woods behind my house. Like it's woods, and you can hide. But the, I'm, there was like a tree here and a tree over there. And how were you out just laying on the ground, like hiding? Like I don't know how you were able to even do it without. We just it's amazing. Just jump to bushes. Yeah. And from one to the other to the other, many times. And then the last running, we run and then terrorists saw us, they shooting on us. Most of my group just died in one second. And I just keep running by myself. And then I jump into a cactus, really big one. Ouch. Huge cactus bush. And I'm hiding between 10.30 in the morning till 7 p.m. Wow. In a cactus. Wow. Dean, you don't have to answer this question, but... So you have, obviously you've served in IDF because everyone, Special Forces, everyone, Sayeret Nachal. Okay. Yeah. Was this the first time you had ever seen someone be killed? Yeah. Um, in the army you train, you're doing mm -hmm. training, you go and do missions, uh, like every forces and special forces, but it's, it's never the army not really train you for the, the, the real moment. You know, you train, you, you get what you need, you learn, you study, but my test was October 7. Yeah. And also I'm without weapon. So basically everything I train, everything I know how to fight and all of that. So I cannot because I don't have with what to fight. Yeah. Um, it was to take care of injuries people till some point that Bart told me to run away. And I started to, to really trying to take care of myself. With the group after they died, I just was completely by myself. And it was between me and God, what I can tell you. Yeah. One of the things that I've experienced with my Jewish friends, and I've of many, is you have a hard exterior. You have to, to live in the world that you've lived in. Um, and you're also very optimistic uh, in the face of seemingly overwhelming obstacles. You guys are, just remain like resolute. But in that moment, did any of the shell crack? Like, did you feel a fear, sadness? Like, what were you feeling in those moments? So when I saw the group dying, it was realized with myself, okay, they, they're not with us anymore. I need, to, I need to keep running. And from all of these hours in the bush, it was honestly... It was a feeling I don't know how to explain. It was more than just sadness. It was nine hours of just waiting inside of the cactus and waiting and waiting. And some point in 2.24, my phone died. So it was also five hours, just me and God. Mm. Just what, me and God. What did you say to God? Honestly, many things. Many things I promised to him. One of them is to be a better person in this world mm -hmm. and to change and... It was many of hours just begging and pray and begging for God for please save me, please help me. Yeah. And yeah, it was really tough hours, honestly. Yeah. It was uh, accepting the death. 
It was realizing with myself that I'm going to die because of three terrorists that get into my bush and leave. Yeah. So it was a lot. It was accepting the death. It was waiting many hours without water, without food, without do number one or number two. And I've noticed that you're wearing um, a, a kippah. Yamaka. Yamaka. And you were working on Shabbat. Shabbat. Did this change your faith? First of all, of course. Uh, I will explain more than that. Um, till the three months before October 7, I've been not even close to be religious. Nothing. Like even nothing. My mom from Ukraine. And it's not really a thing about kosher food and all of that. It's how we grew up. And three months before October 7, because a friend of mine, I started to become closer to God. Start to pray every morning. I start to keep the kosher thing and also put fill in every day to pray. And October 7, it's a, it's a day that my first life ends, but my second life starts. And I know that my story is like, it's only about miracle and many people that love to tell me how much luck I have. For me, I don't think it's luck. You know, for me, I think it's, it's, it was God. We, we, we don't understand sometimes choices of God. And I'm sitting next to a mom that her son is a hostage. Yeah. And we don't understand, but I believe that one day, soon we will understand when all of them will come in the back also. And about faith, for me, it's the best psychology that I have. In my case, God saved my life, but in different case, his son is a hostage. And it's, it's a perspective how you see on the things, how you look on the things. And for me, I'm, I'm appreciate, I'm thankful, you know, um, if it's our son, if it's Bar Kuperstein, if my best friend is still a hostage. So I don't have any reason to complain for nothing, honestly. Yeah. And, and I have a lot of reasons, right? Because I saw death, I, I accept my death and all of that. But still with that, I don't have really reason to complain on, on something. Yeah. Because we have still hostages over there. Yeah, and that's what I want to talk about now. Because So Mo, you have two sons. One of them is sitting right here, 23? And how old is Gabe, 21? Yeah, 21. You know, that's the same age group that that these boys are. And I'm trying to think like how it would feel to not know like where your boys are. <laughs> or, or, or let me fright, you know where they are, but you don't know where they are. Like when you're talking to these guys, what is that, how does that hit you? I would have to imagine, I would feel probably a lot of what Tammy's feeling is probably a lot of anger behind a lot of what happened. I would be furious to know that that happened to my, to my boys, you know, to my kids um, and their friends. I don't want to put words in your mouth, Tammy, but I'm, I'm going to assume that there's a little bit of fight in you and some passion for getting um, not only your, your son back, but um, some answers to how this could have happened. Do you want to share a little bit about that? My son Om has a, several chances to get out of this terrible, terrible place. But he chose to stay. He, he met soldiers who come to rescue him and the others. And he, instead to go with them, he asked him, what do you have in your bags? Give me food, give me water. I'm okay, don't worry about me. I will see you again. I, I must go, go back. And he took this candy that they gave them and go back to this area, to the dangerous area. Rome was like, I'm, I'm telling you what I know from evidence that people who met Rome is in this October 7, in, during this act, attack from 6.30 in the morning until he just before he was kidnapped, Rom kidnapped between 2 and 4 o'clock p.m. Mm. It's a long time. Yes. A long hour. He heard what happened. He heard screams. He saw people. He saw what happened. He saw what they do. He ran, he ran from place to place over and over again 
to try to rescue people and save them and give them hope. For them, he was a leader. For them, he was someone to trust. And when you ask me about anger and question, I prefer right now not deal with this. I, I was, always was a believer person, but when it's happened, I get a closer to God, and I don't ask questions. I only say, thank you, God. I'm thank God that my son, even so that he ran between the bullets a long time, a, long, a lot of hours, he was kidnapped alive. I'm thanking God that Om is alive, and I believe that he is alive still now. And I'm praying to God all day. It's true. I'm broken heart. I'm feeling there is times that I'm falling apart. I'm, oh, I'm going to sleep with tears. I wake up with tears. But I know that my son is alive. Yeah. And whenever I've fallen apart, I see my mom telling me, Mom, I'm, I'm still here. And I'm alive. Mm. Don't let me down. And I, trust God. I, and I'm trusting. I... I, I I, d I don't ask question. I just pray that it sh that God will accept my prayer and bring him back to me alive. You, you must be so proud, right? He's your, your when boy. I get at the first the first that I got, I I still got I getting all the time evidence from people who met home young woman and when they say to me that Tom didn't see death in front of his eyes he didn't fear he understood the situation very very clearly and he took control of it and when I when I get evidence that Tom instead to leave this area and come back and call, go back home safe, he chose to stay and risk his, his life over and over again, not only for the living. I get evidence that Rom risk his life for the death. He goes under heavy fire to hide young women's bodies, the death. Terrorists, terrible monsters, Hamas ISIS, don't get kidnap them or violate their bodies. The horrible things were done to horrible things. You know, horrible, horrible things. When I see yeah. the the video from the Nova, I'm horrified. I'm like frozen from fear, yeah. and I say, if I've been there, I just look someone like Rome. I don't know what to do. Yeah. I don't know where to run. I don't know where to hide. And I search someone that I can trust him to lead me. And I trust him that he protect me like he, he did. Yeah. And when you say if I'm proud of him, now I'm proud. But at first I was so angry about him. Just wanted him to go home. After a few times, like 12 o'clock, you can run, you can go, you can yeah. leave the area. You understand that you can beat them. You can't. You can protect, you can save as much, and you did. Just go away. And He sacrificed himself. There were people alive yeah. because he stayed. And even not for the living. Yeah. Even and for dead bodies it's like yeah. crazy human every normal person who see what happened he will know i need to go out of here 
as much as I can and faster. And he chose to stay. He like he had a mission over there. I don't know what's going on in his head. But this is wrong. Well, he's, so I've, met, I've just met you. But I already know that you are a very strong, fierce faith woman. Yeah. It sounds like he took after his mama. It's all him. Mm-hmm. It's all him. Yeah. Doing this here. <laughs> yeah, but doing this here, when I get evidence what he done in Donova and before, I didn't know a lot of my son. And people come and told me, tell me what wrong for them. I learn about him a lot, and I, I'm starting to, to act like them. Maybe you are already acting like him. Maybe you're out just learning about yourself too. Yeah. Dean, what would you say to people that believe this event is just IDF propaganda? That these are just <laughs> stories. First, I will say, bring them to me. I will talk with them. I will show them a video of me. I will show them evidence and. And basically, I can say, be more smart than you are right now. And I know that the media, it's really easy to go and watch and to take a, a side and just to give your opinion. About myself, I travel around also college kids. I was at the campuses and I spoke over there. So I've been in a lot of protests, honestly. For me, every time I see protests, I just jump into it. And come in really in a peaceful way and who want to talk? My best friend is a hostage and I'm a survivor. And when you say protest, you mean the Gaza pro-Palestinian, pro-Palestinian protest, anti-Israel. It's more anti-Israel than pro-Palestinian. But the, you, you see a yeah. protest like that, you just jump in the middle of it. Yeah, good and, for you. And of course, and I will also. And I, what I'm, I, what I saw in all of these people, honestly, uh, it's people that are stupid. Honestly, it's people that don't know even what happened. And they go and, and take a side. And, and you cannot. If you call yourself adult, if you call yourself a smart person, do research, go and check twice or three times, yeah. and then take a side. Because I know the truth. You know the truth. Tommy know the truth. We all of us know the truth. We are the fact. We speak in from what we're saying. It's a fact. It's not opinions. Yeah. And someone that is in the other side of the world, after a few videos that he saw in TikTok or Instagram, he take a side. Honestly, for me, it's a joke. For me, yeah. when I go to these campuses, I see 90, 20, 21, 22 years old kids that we're kind of the same age. But the difference between our case to American kids is that we in 18 take a weapon and go protect my country. Yeah. And there they focus on college parties and TikTok and media and Instagram. Yeah. So to all of these people that still don't understand, come and speak with Rome mom, come and speak with Tommy, come speak with more... 100 families, one of them my best friend. All of the people that don't believe, that still thinking with themselves that maybe or not, we, we don't have about what discuss. Yeah, It's a truth, it's a fact, it's happened, and we still have hostages. And with all of the respect, the war and the suffering of Gaza civilians people, it will not stop. It will not stop till the last hostage will come in back. Yes. You know? Yeah, so what, that was the question that I wanted to ask uh, politicians have op- <clears throat> uh, opinions. We just had an election here. Uh, as of this recording, uh, the new president, the 47th president of the United States is Donald uh, J. Trump. Thanks God. Thanks. Well, you've just answered my question. So, why, why do you say that? That was like an instant response. Why yeah. do you say thank God? That's what I hope yeah. it will be. And I trust God that he did it. Yeah. What is it about President Trump uh, that is different than Vice President Harris. What, why is he a better option for what's happening here in America? But really, really what's happening? President, yeah, yeah. Which is still, yeah. We forget Joe we, Biden. <laughs> we actually have a president, but we keep forgetting he's there because they're keeping him in a basement somewhere. But what uh, what is better about Donald Trump? So I've seen the embassy in Jerusalem. I've been to Trump Heights, you know, in the Golan Heights. <laughs> um, what is it that is, is, as far as Israel, and by the way, they're saying this in Uganda, they're saying this in Nepal, the whole world, the, the people that I know are like, they're so, they're relieved that Donald Trump won, which our media is confused by. You're on the ground. What is it that you think, okay, this is a good thing for America and a good thing for Israel? Yeah. For Israel, I think 
Uh, because for, for us, he showed us the most support, I think, what he did in Israel. And, and also for the America, I think he's really one of the best business, successful businessmen in all of the world, I think. I believe that he's really smart. Mm-hmm. I cannot really too much to speak about him because I'm not a civilian of the United States. But from, from a little bit, and I know, I think he's really, he's a person that probably will fix few things because he finished the last time, his time as a president, and then the COVID, and then also Russia, Ukraine, and now we on the war. So basically, he's a president that left the office and many crazy things happen. Yeah. And now he's back to the office. And for us, for Israel, he showed the most of support, I think, so all of the presidents, if yeah. I, I don't know. And... The thing that he did, in my opinion, um, in his four years in office was uh, Iran, Hezbollah, the Houthis, they, they only understand one language, and that is strength right. and power. And so I remember when he uh, vaporized uh, Soleimani from Iran on, the, on a runway in Iraq, just... And every, of course, the media in America was, oh my gosh, he's going to cause World War III. But what he did was show the Ayatollah, oh, yeah. we're coming for you and hell's coming with us. And what is true of Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthis, or the, the entire radical Islamic world is they're cowards. Um, they will, they love to come and shoot when no one can shoot back. They love to put their own children in between them and as protection. And so they're cowards. So if someone is strong and will, and what we've, ex- what we've experienced with our former president Obama uh, and president of Biden is they had this naive idea that if we were just nice enough to them, you know, if we sent them pallets of cash, which happened, you know, in Iran, president Obama sent, it was like an episode of breaking bad, just sending pallets of cash and it did nothing for them. And what ended up happening even with Hamas is they spent two years being bolstered. And I don't want to get into the geopolitical on the ground. I know there's some complications with Netanyahu and things. So that's, that's, that's for another podcast. But, but for us, that's what I felt. We just needed somebody strong enough to scare these guys. Um, they say that if you want to uh, avoid war, or, uh, if you want peace, prepare for war, right? right? And if you want war, prepare for peace. Right. And that that feels like what we're for us anyway in America that we've got a sense of relief for that. Um, let me switch as we're kind of coming back around. I, I, I do want to say again, it's it's Ram, right? It's Bar. These are names. These are real people that are really hostages right now. Um, like Dean, if you were sitting in front of uh, of Bar right now, or if he you knew he could see you on video. What would you say to him? Like he's watching you, he happens to roll across this somehow. What would, what, would you have a message for him? First, I would say that I'm proud of him. I love him. I love you. And I'm alive because he don't know if I'm alive or dead. Basically, mm-hmm. he don't know if I'm survived the novel or not. So this is what I want to tell him the first thing that he would not have been alive. And I'm proud of him. I'm proud how, how he acts. And for me, for me, he's a hero. He's exactly the example for a hero. Bao, her son, Rom. For me, it's a hero. Sometimes, most of the times, you don't want to be the hero. Probably no one wants to be the hero, right? But sometimes, God chooses for us. And for me, it's, it's, it's the most example to be a man, 100%. It's more than that. Yeah. It's to, to choose in a different life, it's to choose to take care of the others and not to take care of yourself. This is only what the, this is the difference also between me, her son, and Bao, and more hostages. I want to help, I help, I take care of the injured people, but till some point, till at some point that I understand with myself that I need to take care of myself also. And f- for, for her, her son is a hero. Of course, we want everyone home. And this is the difference. They stay with all of how much is crazy what happened there. And they choose to stay. They choose on everyone, just not about themselves. Yeah. Tommy, I would ask you the same question. You know, um, 
Yeah. If Rom saw you on a camera, a FaceTime video, or even, yeah. what, what would you say to him? Rom is a man with honor. When he ki when he make a promise to someone, he will do whatever he can to keep it. He promised me in the our last call at ten o'clock that a few hours he will be at home. So, Rom, I want you to know that even so, that a few hours became days, weeks, months, and a year. I will do whatever it takes. I won't give up. I'll do everything with my power to bring you back, that this year won't go to be become years. One need to one point is birthday in the captivity that last December and next month he will be celebrate with me and with my family, with his little brother Ziv, who miss him so much. Mm. And his big brother Amit who worry about him every each every moment in the day. And um, I want you to know that I'm here and I'm waiting for you. And I wait until you come back to me again, alive, until I hear you and I hold you in my arms again. And I just wait you from you to keep your promise to me. Just come home. Tell me, what, uh, what kind of interaction have you had with Israeli government in terms of communication and trying to bring him home? Has there been um, good dialogue there or information or consistent communication in that way? Yeah. For every family, uh, for the 101 hostages, there is a, an officer from the army that we keep touch with her, whatever we want. The government don't make appointments with us. If we want to talk to anyone, we need to reach the officer and tell her that we want to meet the prime minister or whatever. And she and they willing to meet with us, but always the the same answers. We do whatever we can military and political to, to bring them home. Mm. And you know what? I believe them. I read today, this morning actually, that Netanyahu has placed a, a $5 million reward for anyone that brings a hostage forward. Mm. Um, they announced that this morning, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. I didn't hear it. You heard it? Yeah, it's just yeah, this is new. new for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, any anyone um, that has uh, information or whereabouts or will bring a hostage uh, wow. forward, their five million dollars and travel and protection. So he's basic. That's an interesting technique, huh? Tommy, do you dream about? I dream yeah. about the moment that I will see him yeah. back again. So he comes to you in your dreams. In my imagination. Imagination. I yeah. can't dream it. In yeah. my imagination, I imagine him come home and say, look all the posters and the shirts that we are going with yeah. his picture. And he would say, mom, what's going on? What are you doing? <laughs> He's going to be so proud of you, yeah. though, to know that you fought to bring him home. You traveled, you literally left your home, you flew to the United States. You're sitting here in a Christian church with us, guys you've never met, to, to, to try to fight to bring him home. He's gonna be so proud of you when he knows all that. Like and I'm we, proud of him. Yeah, and we believe that that's gonna happen. And Dean, you're, you're on a bit of a, a tour of, of sorts. You're, you're traveling all across America. What, where's next for you? Friday to Chicago, and then Florida. And then Montreal, Toronto, California, New Jersey, New York, Arizona, probably, Australia, and then to Israel. Mm. Wow. 
Yeah, I'm traveling a lot. Uh, two questions for you about that. One, have you experienced in any of the universities the anti-Semitism that we're seeing on the campuses? Have, have you had protests when you speak? Has anyone you know, tried to yell at you? Have you experienced any of that? Uh, not for something like that, but if it's to host by friends for Yom Kippur, and the day, the day after pro-Palestinians come and start to write a few things on his building, mm. and then he's like, share with us. Yeah. Um, but not really. They have their protest that they come in with the flags, with signs, with a lot of, you know, a show. Mm -hmm. And I just coming in a peaceful way, trying to talk with him. Yeah. And honestly, I don't afraid. I don't afraid to speak with him. For me, it's only kids. They, they, don't, they don't know nothing yeah. about their life right now. I can, I'm learning from you right now because, first of all, I know you've been IDF, so you could, you could break their neck. <laughs> basically, yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm basically. I'm a peaceful guy. Yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, Jordan Peterson talks about true masculinity is you should be dangerous and you should have it under control. Because if you're not dangerous at all and you don't, there's nothing to control, there's no nobility in that. But being dangerous, but then controlling it. And the reason of being dangerous is then when the monsters do come, you do what you do. You got and you helped. But in those moments to remain peaceful and calm, like I'm as a Christian man who follows a, a, a Messiah who says he's the Prince of Peace, you know, I'm a little convicted by that, you know, because, you know, if I were, if I were like you and trained like you, I'd just rather wring their neck and, you know, it yeah. feels, if, but I, that's not how peace will come. I know. Right. Um, and then the other question was, have you felt the support? Because my friends who are Jewish um, friends, my, uh, I shouldn't say their names because I have not their permission, but one of them said he grew up in New Jersey and he grew up learning to, if he saw a Christian, he thought of us kind of like a snake. Um, be very suspicious, maybe cross the street on the other side. Uh, not He didn't hate me, but just wouldn't want to be friends with me. But now we're friends. Yeah. Um, have you experienced, what has surprised you the most when you're around Christians like us in America that you did not expect? So two things. First about the Christian, I will say that I didn't know that we have the support from the Christian people in America. Honestly, I believe that the Christian, they're not really involved on the situation. Of course, you have people that yes, but I saw a lot of support. I spoke many churches, honestly. And, and with that, I have the Jewish communities, the support from them also, that if not the Christian people and the Jewish people that I met all of this year with the traveling, honestly, I don't know how I will do this. And now it's Elizabeth that helped me and different states. It's more amazing woman that helped me. And if if not these, I, I call it angel. For me, it's like God sent me angels to help me to do what I need to do. Yeah. And this is how I feel. And you know, I will say something about Christian people. Probably both of you, I mean, maybe heard it in the speech two days ago. But about myself, my grandmother, she's a Christian. She passed away two years ago. Mm. My mom was a Christian that converted to be a Jewish. I became a Jewish in five years old, basically, mm -hmm. after my mom converted. My dad's side, dad of my dad, my grandfather is a Muslim from Uzbekistan. Mother of my dad, my grandmother also passed away. She's a Jewish. So I have basically my family, I have Christianity, I have Islam and I have Jewish. For me, of course, I'm a wow. Jewish. I, I born and raised on the Jewish holidays and all of that. And yes. Jewish and I've been also in Jewish school and elementary school but in my family I have everything and what I'm saying to the people also the speeches is not about if you're Jewish or Christian or Muslim it's all about humanity in the end of the day we're all of us with the same the same body the same head the same hands the same everything yeah. all of here we're only for a limit time that's it 60 70 80 90 Bezat Hashem 120 right but still we have limit time mm -hmm. becoming to live and I believe it if if the people all of the world will understand the situation they will understand that we the same and we only limit time then the peace will come yeah then and not before yeah yeah we um we I can't remember which friend said this I've had a few Jewish friends have told me that you know the the way we'll know if Christians were right or Jews were right was when Messiah comes, we'll ask him one question. Is this your first time? Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, and I love that because we, uh, we have in, in the Christian faith, you may or may not have heard this, but in the book of Romans, it speaks of the Jewish people, you guys, you know, of like, God's not in the Christian faith. God's not done with the Jewish people. Like that's, we, our faith says that we are adopted into your, your family, not the other way around. So uh, Paul, the apostle Paul, who was a Jew, uh, wrote that, you know, we have an, we owe an enormous debt of gratitude to the Jewish people. So the, the, the things that have been told in the media that, you know, Christians hate Jews and that, you know, it's, there are, there, there are, you know, just like in any faith, there are people that are on the edges that say crazy things, but, but the teachings of Jesus that we follow, that the majority of Christians follow, that's why so many Christians go to Israel. You know, you see those buses go by and think, well, that's great. They're helping the economy. I wonder what the world they're doing there. You know, we're there because we view that land as God's land. We view it as uh, your land. We view it as that, you know, a nation was born in a day that that was God's will, prophetically speaking, that was supposed to happen. We, we believe all of that. You know, so that's, we support it uh, as part of our faith, you know, and therefore we support you guys as part of our faith. And, and I want to, before we end this, I want to pray. And with your permission, um, with Jesus, who, who we follow, um, and we had an opportunity to do this for Almog. Um, and within a few months, Almog was miraculously freed, you know, and I'm, we have no miraculous powers. I do want to point that out. But what we have is the same thing you have, which is we have faith. We have faith. And so, completely. Um, and our faith is, uh, what does the prophet say? It's not in a chariot and in horses, but in God. You know, so that's where our faith is. And sometimes he used chariots and horses. But uh, so with that, I, I, let, let's, let's pray for these hostages. If you're, if you're watching, these are, these are not numbers on a screen. These are real people. Son. This is a real son, you know, a real brother, a real friend, real, you know. Yes. So... If you may, yes, please. I just want to say that people always come to me and say to me, you know, we pray for all the hostages. We have a list. And we pray for all the hostages and remember all the names. And I say to them, please learn about the hostages. Yes. It's not only a name, it's a person yeah. with family, it's yes. a whole world about him. And you need to know that this person, it's not only a name and number in the list. And we can normalize this because we must end it. Yes. And that's why we are praying all the time. Yeah. And, and for those of us that are here today and those that are viewing this today or listening online, um, you now have two names and you have two stories. And we'll put their images up um, uh, on the video so you'll be able to see them while we're praying. But I, I would ask if you're listening to this today uh, and you are a praying person that you're gonna add these guys onto your list of people mm -hmm. to pray for. Even if you don't know any of the other names and numbers, I know there's a lot of no names on the list, but, um, but we at least know two. Mm -hmm. And so with that, let's, let's pray. God, um, we put our trust in you today. We put our hope in you today. And I'm, I'm so inspired by uh, the, the courage uh, that I'm experiencing here today from Dean. And I'm really inspired by the, the faith from Tammy. And with that, we say with courage and with faith today, please bring home Bar. Please bring home Ram. Amen. These are your children. They are part of your, your chosen people. The, the, the hatred that they have experienced um, at the hands of, of evil, wicked men, uh, it's because they hate you, God. These evil, wicked men hate you, and they're punishing these young men because of that hatred. So we ask you, Father, our God to, to move on their behalf. Uh, we saw it happen with Almog, uh, the, the, the courageous work of some IDF soldiers made it happen. You often use that and maybe that's what you'll do this time. But what we ask for 
is quickly. I just quickly, quickly, quickly. It's already been one year, three weeks, and six days. Maybe even today, God. Maybe today you would do that for them. And in the meantime, would you uh, be with and strengthen Tammy as she heads to her next destination and with Dean as he is a conduit of, uh, of truth and courage on college campuses that are hearing, um, they're, they're hearing narrative, they're being indoctrinated and to be able to actually see truth and meet truth like Dean and, and pray that he'll continue to keep that uh, kindness and shalom in his life that he can give that to others. Uh, we pray these things together as, as believers in you, Jehovah, and us as followers of you, Jesus, the Messiah. We pray that in that name. In that name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, Dean, Tommy, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming all the way to Middle Tennessee to spend time with us and tell us your story and, and putting uh, a story with just the name. It's, it's more than a name. So thank you for, for doing that with us today. And if you're looking for more information about um, how you can help or how you can get involved, October 7 Coalition. Dot com Is that correct? Yeah. Th- and just very quickly, for those that don't know, Elizabeth is here somewhere. Uh, our church was honored to be one of the very first, maybe the first two or three churches with Patricia Heaton, with Elizabeth, to speak on behalf of our Israeli brothers and sisters at a world that is screaming hate. We wanted to speak with courage and love. And the October 7th coalition was born out of that, of showing our Jewish brothers, we want Nashville to be the safest place in America for Jewish people to be and ultimately we want the world to be safe for jewish people so that's october 7th coalition yeah october 7 coalition.com you can learn more there as always you can find out more information about what we're doing here at conduitchurch.com thank you for joining us for this deeper podcast